What's up? This is a Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. I'm your host, Sean Dustin. This is episode eight. Today I talked to Angelise Tomasino. She is the head of operations for the Facebook page, Come With Me. Come With Me is a movement to bring people of Chicago together as one to put an end to the senseless violence that's wiping out our loved ones. So Angelise is working in the inner cities of Chicago to kind of help uh, spread awareness and stop the senseless violence that's happening in that part of the country. And she is an addict herself uh, in recovery, and she has a great story, very raw, very real, perfect for this podcast. Also, I need to let you guys know about a interview that I was in for the Uncontained podcast, uh, the host of that, Aaron Static Render. Aaron, I appreciate you having me on that show. You did an excellent job editing that, so I sound like I actually know what I'm talking about. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, he did a he did a great job, and I, I thank you. And if you guys can check it out, it's a good uh, show, and it's also a good episode. Um, I really, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Also, uh, you know, I need I need some feedback on something. So if you guys have a chance to, uh, after this podcast, or whenever you can, uh, drop me a line on one of my social medias, or actually email me, or hit me up on uh, Instagram, at nowhere to go but up now. My question is, so... My aspirations in my local union are to be a business agent, and I haven't let any of them know about this podcast. For whatever reason, I, I, I fear that they may try and use some of that information that I provide uh, in this podcast, you know, in my past and, and some of my current uh, stuff that I disclose in here. Um, am, I, am I being ridiculous? I mean, should I just... Am I thinking about this too much? And should I just say, fuck it? And hey, man, let the cards fall where they will. And if you guys want to judge me on something that I've done in my past and and not, you know, what I'm currently trying to do in the future with this podcast and helping people and, you know, trying to make a difference in, in the way that I know how. Is that a bad thing or is it a good thing? I, I don't know, man. I just I know that I really want to make a difference here and I also want to make a difference in my union. So I don't know. I'm kind of at an impasse here. You know, there's a couple people that have, uh, randomly found out about it and I like freaked out and I went and, you know, Oh, you guys, Hey, you know, keep this on the DL. And, 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 you know, just, I felt like I was being so ridiculous about it. Like, what are you afraid of? So, yeah, I mean, if you guys could drop me a line and, you know, if I'm being stupid or ridiculous or, you know, I just let me know. And that, honestly, the only reason that I say anything about it or that I'm concerned is that they've already tried to eliminate me as a, as a contender in this thing by, you know, one of the, somebody came, you know, to one of the officers and was like, Hey, this guy's was been in prison. You know, uh, he can't be a businessman, a business agent. And I mean, it's, yeah, it's true. It's in our bylaws that, that, you know, if you've been to prison, there needs to be a certain amount of time that's gone by. And I've, I've, exceeded that time by three years so i mean it's not that big of a deal and it's actually a non a non thing but as it is you know once you get up into these levels of political stuff you've always got somebody who you know it's obviously someone who's who knows that they don't have a a uh you know like i'm, I'm a competition for them so it's just easier to try to get me out of the way than actually go up against me so i don't know Anyways, like I said, I could use the help out there. You know, uh, I'm kind of stuck on this. Don't know which way to go with it. And yeah, so if you could just hit me back and, and let me know what your thoughts are. So without further ado, let's get to Angelise and her story. Hi, Annalise. How are you? 
how are you? I'm doing well and doing well. Thank you. And uh, welcome to the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. Um, I'm your host, Sean Dustin, and we are going to talk to Annalise tonight about addiction and her uh, her purpose, her mission, and, and what she's doing out in the city of Chicago. So go ahead, Anna. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. So the hashtag come with me, um, I I found you through looking in uh, one of the groups. I think it was a recovery group that you belong to. Mm Mm-hmm, yes. And I was just going through there because my my podcast is, you know, you know, nowhere to go but up, and that is all about... Well, it's not all about, but it, it really um, focuses on people who have bottoms in their life and how they get through them because everybody goes through different stuff and everybody gets through things differently. Um, and that's just kind of what my mission is. And then I throw some other stuff in between, you know, like uh, uh, things that are interesting to myself. And, uh, and, and so that, that's kind of what I'm doing. So I reached out to you. And I saw that you had about a thousand or eleven hundred followers on your uh, on your Facebook page, and what you were doing seemed pretty interesting to me. And as a fellow addict, um, I, I I understand what that life and what that world is uh, about. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, I think pretty much everybody that's living and breathing today can say that if they have do not have an addiction themselves, that they at the very least know somebody that has one. Um, I feel that addiction has become a stigma, and I'm doing my best now through all of the lows and the rock bottoms and the endless amount of mistakes and everything that I've made through my life during the course of my active addiction and just trying to show people that there's a way out. I mean, and I know in my heart and in my soul, if I can get out of the hole that I was in, that literally anybody else can. And that's all I'm trying to do is just show everybody what I have learned and through my mistakes, how I have found some of the biggest strengths in me that have propelled me to completely change my life around for the better in ways that I never in a million years thought possible. I did not think I would be living the life I'm living now 10 years ago. I didn't think I'd be living the life I'm living now a year ago. Absolutely not. So I am just very thankful and very blessed to be able to be here today to share what I have learned with other people. Yeah, I believe that there are no coincidences in life. People cross paths, even even this uh, people cross paths or are brought together, uh, for a purpose, you know, whatever that purpose is. I don't know if you, you know, if you believe in God or whatever your higher power is, or, you know, for me, it's the universe. And, uh, I just, yeah, I, I understand exactly, uh, what you're talking about. What, uh, what was your drug of choice? Uh, I was addicted to opioid pain pills, hardcore, heavy, like 50 to 50 to 60 a day at my absolute worst. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah, I was bad. Actually, what landed me in jail actually was my, one of my rock bottoms was I stole a prescription pad from a doctor's office and was writing out illegal scripts to sell the people and to take for myself. And I got away with it for a little bit, but then got caught up and ended up doing some time. For uh, forgery and possession of a controlled substance. How much time did you end up doing? Uh, seven months. Are you still on uh, probation or par- parole? Or it'd probably be probation. No, no, no. I got uh, nope. I am all parole or uh, off probation and everything. I got locked up June sixteenth, two thousand fourteen, and I came home January twenty first, I believe, two thousand fifteen. And I've been off of probation since 2016. And then how long have you been uh, uh, clean? Um, Well, actually, that's a large part of how I got started with Come Find Me. Um, Last June 16th, 
I would have had four years clean, but I actually ended up relapsing for the first time in almost four years, a few days before my anniversary date. So this June 16th, I will have one year clean. That's well, part of the process. I mean, you know, some, for some people, it, it, you know, they, they get it their first shot. For me, it, it was, uh, I'm the kind of person that, that had to hit his head against the same wall four or five times before I realized, Oh shit, I got to go right or left. I can't, I, you know, and some people get it right off the bat. You know, there's no telling what, uh, you know, what, what the actual formula is. Everybody's different. You know what? Honestly, this relapse was probably one of the best things that could have ever happened to me because it, it made me face that I was sick and tired of my own shit. I don't know if I can say shit on your podcast. I'm very sorry. Oh, uh, you can fucking say whatever you want. It was a very, very pivotal... <laughs> well, that's a relief. It was a very pivotal moment in my life when I became sick and tired of my own shit. You know, I had been home back with my family and everything, and while I was physically sober, you know, not ingesting any any opioids or anything... I hadn't changed my thinking, so I still had the addict's mentality. You know, the no trusting, the, you know, no talking, you know, putting on a facade, you know, just, and then always being a very empathetic person by nature and trying to shut that down because I didn't want to feel anything, you know, let alone take in what other people are feeling and things like that. It was, it was horrible. I mean, I, I was a relapse waiting to happen. And when I relapsed, Last year, for the very, very first time ever in my entire life, I owned it. I went to my husband, told him what I did, and it was within a couple days of that event that my entire life started to change for in amazing, (laughs) absolutely amazing, incredible ways. Ways that I still have a hard time comprehending, truly. You had mentioned that you believe in God. Well, I cursed God my entire life. My enti- and I don't just mean, you know, like, why well, God? I mean, I mean, on my knees, my fingers in the air, cursing God. And now I can feel him working through me, for lack of a better term. I don't know how else to call it. I absolutely know what my purpose is, and I'm making my way towards that now with Come Find Me. And I have a book that's being, in, it's in the middle of being published right now, and things are doing really, really, really good. Oh, that's great. Absolutely um, amazing in just a year's time. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's awesome, man. I'm I'm happy for you. Um it's you know, addiction's a tough thing, man. Um God though, I, I, I'm I'm not a practicing uh religious person. Uh I believe in the universe. So it's not I just I have a I if, I believe that they're one and the same because I know what you're saying and I, I tend to feel that I'm more spiritual than religious one hundred percent. I mean you're not I have zero faith in the Catholic Church just with the way everything is nowadays and when I say God I equate God with the universe. I think it's all connected. I think we are all connected to everything. I mean, even if you want to get down, you know, to the grass, the trees. We are all intertwined and this is something that I know deep rooted in my soul to be true. When I I look at, you know, the air, the earth, you know, all the elements and everything, it's just all one big picture that we're all part of. I don't know if there's a big, you know, there's one big guy looking down on us. You know what I mean? I have no idea. But there's definitely something out there much bigger than all of us that we are a part of. We just have to turn around and acknowledge it. Yeah, for sure. I believe that as well. I, I know that we're all we're all energy, uh, you know, sentient beings, energy uh, uh, type of, um, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we, and we are all connected in some sort of way. I know that, you know, with all the devices and everything else, and I've said this a few times that we, we definitely are being distracted away from our natural abilities that, that, you know, we have been able to do, um, probably, you know, way back in the day, you know, we had a lot more, what do they call that when you have a like psychic ability not psychic abilities but like when you can just sort of think something and 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 something else will happen yeah no i i understand what you're saying yeah, more or less a psychic like intuition you know things of that nature 
Yeah, for sure. So did you, uh, did you, you know, use, uh, NA or, or AA or, um, what, what was it for you that, that kind of helped you, um, aside, aside from, you know, being locked up? Honestly, I, I am like the worst recovering addict ever because I haven't done anything by the way, you know, the books say or anything like that. Uh, See, when I went to jail, I was forced into sobriety. It wasn't my choice to get clean. I had to get clean because I was going to jail. And I did start receiving um, help. You know, I had a therapist, you know, things of that nature while I was locked up. But it was up to me to continue to get the help and stuff that I needed after I got out. And I didn't do that. So there's a big difference between clean on your own because you're just ready to get clean and then being forced into it. And I think that that a lot of times is a big factor into whether or not the person is going to be able to stay clean. I simply wasn't ready. I mean, I thought that jail was my absolute rock bottom, being away from my family, my husband, my son at the time. I thought that was my rock bottom and I'm, I'm never going to use again. You know, I, I said it 50 million times in there. I said it to, to Jason, my husband. I said it to myself. I said it to the girls that I was locked up with, but... Bottom line is it's my ego was took over my humility, and that's why even now, even knowing or even feeling much more confident now that I will never use again, I will never say that I will never use again. I will just say that I will not use today. I do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. I have no idea. But I know that if I ever get to the point where I do have the desire to use again, that I can, I have to reach out for help. And I'm not ashamed of that anymore either. We all need help. Every single one of us, every single person could benefit from a therapist or confiding to a trusted friend or family member or something. We all need help. And I think that that is a large part of an issue that, I mean, not even just addicts or people that have been in jail, or I mean, just people in general have forgotten that it's okay to need help. Nobody wants to ask for it anymore because they think it makes them weak. Not understanding that reaching out for help is one of the most brave, courageous things that you can do instead. Everything seems backwards to me in our society, and it breaks my heart on a daily basis. It truly does. No, I I get what you're saying. Um, This is That's part of the the reason why as well that I'm, I'm doing this podcast is because, you know, for some people out there and I know it worked for myself and, you know, I, I, I had, it's, it's a little bit different when I'm putting my own stamp on it and, you know, people know who I am and my story's out there. So, you know, and it was, I, I don't know, after I did my first, if I did my first episode, which was kind of like the intro that, that, um, kind of told my story, uh, not the whole thing, but just sort of, you know, I, I, enough to, to qualify myself for what I'm doing. Um, after a couple of days, I was kind of, I was kind of nervous at first, but after a couple of days, it's like, you know, it, it just a weight was lifted off of me. And it was at that point, I'm like, man, this is, you know, I need to get other people to talk and tell their stories, you know, and they can just be anonymous if they want to be. And, and, you know, that in itself is therapeutic. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Um, you know, you had asked, and I'm sorry, I don't think I directly answered your question, you know, how I stay sober and what I do differently now. And it's a lot of it is that is you have to, find something that works for you that you can't be dependent on another person for that will bring you some type of peace. I mean, that's one, you know, one tool, but it's a very useful, successful one for most people. I think me, it turned out to be writing. I never considered myself a writer, but I find that it is a lot more difficult to ignore your demons or dark spots when they're staring you in the face as opposed to just, you know, hidden in the back of your mind. Um, That was one of the biggest things that helped me get my shit together was being honest with myself 
and admitting that, you know, I had hung on to the victim mentality with two hands, <laughs> you know, because it was easier to say, well, you know, no, I, I am an addict because, you know, yeah, it was, you know, raped or, you know, my dad, you know, hated me and, you know, all the bullshit I went through, you know, being shot, being stabbed, you know, watching, you know, just having the life that I had, it's a lot easier just to blame everything bad that's ever happened to you and, you know, and everybody else and the whole world is against you, not realizing that there's 50 million other people out there that have it way worse than you do. You know what I mean? It's just, it's easier to feel sorry for yourself. It's easier to try to get people to feel sorry for you. And it makes it easier to ignore all the pain and whatnot that you're inflicting on other people, too. Is that right there is one of the hardest things in the entire universe to ever do, is to look yourself in the mirror, admit that you have messed up, and start making shit right to the people that you've hurt. Now, that's where freedom comes from is owning up to all that. That is where you get true freedom from all the baggage that you have carried around with you for years, and it is the most amazing amazing feeling. You said it felt like a weight being lifted. That's exactly what it felt like to me. Once I started looking people in the eye and just saying, you know what, I did this, 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 not making any excuses, you know, I did this because, you know, I needed pills because of my addiction, because all this of it. No, because then you're making it about you. You know, you look at the person, you admit what you did, you say, I'm sorry. You do your best to make amends to the person. If they forgive you, great. If they don't, you need to accept it. You don't get to tell people how they're supposed to react to your apology after you've hurt them. You know what I mean? But like I said, there's just, there's a freedom, there's a release in it. And it's, it's, it's amazing using integrity and just honesty. It's some of the most powerful tools that I have come across yet. And it hasn't steered me wrong. Not once. I have found that as long as I am doing shit the right way with the right intentions in my heart for the right reason, that life is damn near magical at times. Yeah, it can be. It can be. I, I know, I know the feeling. So in my, you know, in my, in my addictions and my, you know, upbringing and, um, uh, you know, just how I was going through life, uh, I, I learned a lot of bad habits and, and, and not really how to treat people, right? Like I, I would just, you know, people were there for my, uh, whatever whatever it is that i needed from you basically is what it was and even though you know when i stopped using my my drug of choice was meth but i've done everything i mean i was selling drugs uh everything that i would sell i would do and so i mean i i had i would just go from one to the next to the next to the next the only thing that i never really did was heroin but i mean i had an opioid problem i had you know i got prescribed uh, some and you know that just ended up and they knew I was an addict too because I, I told them and they still gave them to me um so I I I totally I totally get that and I just lost my train of thought <laughs> where I where I was go, where I was going with that um but yeah I mean the uh the it, it just it doesn't matter man it's it's all about what you feed and that's what, and that's kind of what I figured out. You know, I was, I was kind of a shitty person. I mean, even in all my relationships and how I dealt with things, um, I, you know, I was, I would just try to muscle my way through it. Like if you didn't, if you didn't agree with me or, you know, if I was in a relationship with you, you know, you know, some of those guys are, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not beating you up, but they might as well be because they're, you know, they're, they're just beating you up in a different way. And, it, it took me a while to, to kind of realize and, and, and take a look and say, Hey man, you know, you're, you're kind, of, you're just kind of not a nice person. And, you know, the way that you go about, you're a dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The way that you go about doing shit is just kind of fucking foul, dude. And, you know, I just, I, it, it I don't know. It's just, it's just one of those things that you, you know, you have to take a hard look at yourself and, and, you know, realize that, that 
things need to change. I mean, yeah, even though the, the, the drugs aren't there, I mean, if you're not dealing with, you know, the other things, I mean, it's, it's going to come out somewhere, you know, that all, all, whatever the symptom is, I mean, that's all they are, just symptoms of, of the problem that's going on inside that you're not dealing with. And you keep doing these things like, like every time I would lash out and just like, just be verbally fucked. After that, dude, I would feel like such shit. And I'm like, dude, ah, man, I did that shit again. And it's just, I don't know. You just get tired of it. And, and, and it just, it, it comes out. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, if you're not, if you're not treating the actual problem, the symptoms will st- still keep popping up in different areas of your life, you know, whether it's in, you know, I would, I was, I, you, what, what got me kind of clean was, or did get me clean was I, I went into adult slow pitch softball and I really got involved in it. And it was a more positive outlet to doing things. Um, that was, it was just giving me self esteem and it, the things that I was doing, it wasn't disappointing people, which would make me feel bad and then make me want to go and use and be just like, Oh, well I might as well. I mean, I'm I'm a piece of shit anyways. You know how you just justify your, your fucked up behavior. You use every excuse you possibly can. You know, any, the wind blows, right? Oh shit. That's fucked up. I got to go use. Oh yeah, absolutely. As an addict, I mean, you will, like you said, you will justify anything and everything, and you literally just accept that you're a piece of shit, and you refuse to really even do anything about it. I mean, and that is exactly what an addict in active addiction is. They, I was, I was, and I will say myself, I was a selfish, miserable, manipulative, dangerous, cold, heartless woman. There's no other way around it. My actions were despicable. The things, the things that I have done in my life, I mean, are things that I have made peace with now, but that literally used to just tear me apart inside. And it wasn't until I faced all of those things that I was able to begin healing. And that is why I know without, I have messed up every single which way that there is to mess up. And it used to discourage me in so many different ways because I just couldn't get it right, no matter what I did. I knew in my heart that I was a good person. I know that I would give the shirt off my back to anybody. And 99% of addicts that I know are the same way. We have the biggest hearts. It's just our actions. Addiction turns you into a demon. I mean, I, there's no other way to describe what we're capable of during that time. The selfish acts and everything. But what I tell people to do now is to go into the bathroom or wherever, close the door, make sure by yourself, look in the mirror and say, I love me. And it's a lot harder than it sounds. Because, one, it feels ridiculous to do so, but most people don't truly love themselves and they know that they're going to be lying if they say it out loud and it's a lot different looking yourself in the face than it is lying to somebody else. Very, very difficult to lie directly to yourself. And I realized the very first time that I looked at myself in the mirror and knew that I didn't love myself and I knew exactly what I had to do. I had to start working on my shit. It wasn't until I started reaching in and, you see, if if you cut a tree off in the middle, it's going to grow back. You have to go down deep into your soul and you have to get to the root of the problem. I myself just had a huge breakthrough. Actually, my birthday a couple months ago, March 11th, I was laying in bed and I was waiting for my husband to come to bed and I, out of nowhere, and I still don't understand why it happened the way it did, but I remembered, like, the very first, like, traumatic event that happened that kind of warped my brain. I was a very, very little girl. And now the following weeks afterwards were terrible. I mean, I just... I felt like a like a raw, exposed nerve that kept getting, like, electrocuted over and over and over again. But 
instead of running from it, I faced it. I allowed myself to feel everything. And then as time goes on, it it does heal. It got a little better, a little bit better every day. And I cannot, you know, it felt good starting like off making the small things in my life, right? You know, talking to people and just slowly making progress. But being able to get to the root of everything, it's, it, it freed me. I mean, it was probably one of the most painful things I have ever endured. I'm sitting here shaking, just thinking about it, talking to you about it, you know, but it was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, I, I have no fear left in me at all. And I've spent my entire life being scared, scared of everything, of everybody. And I, and I, and I'm not, I have no fear in me anymore. None. That's why my belief is so strong in the fact that, that there is something bigger out there. I, it's, it's not something I can deny ever again. I know it as sure as I know myself now. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. What, what was that root, if you don't mind me asking? Like, what was the root of all of that for you? Um, oh, I have never talked about this out loud. It's actually in my book, but I haven't ever said it out loud to anybody. Uh, it was a memory that I had had um, when I was a little girl. I uh, I got up to uh, to get something to drink, and in order to get to the kitchen, I had to walk through the living room. And I was walking down the hallway towards the living room, and I saw my father watching a movie with a woman getting, like, viciously raped by multiple men. And, I mean, we didn't have DVR boxes or anything like that, obviously, back in the day, but, I mean, it was a movie, and he, he kept rewinding it over and over and over again, you know, like, leaning closer. I mean, it was... I didn't understand it then, obviously. I mean, there's no way any child could have possibly comprehended anything or the fact that it had nothing to do with her or you know what I mean there's there was nothing it's not my fault pretty much but that was a pivotal point in my life for me I mean my relationship with my father has never been good and I mean I haven't spoken to him in years as it is but that was the turning point in my life where a mental block just, I mean, your mind's first priority is to protect you at all costs. So what does it do? It puts a wall up, you know, pushes it to the back of your mind, you know, to protect you from it. That's why traumas are not your fault. The traumas that you go through are not your fault, but it is 100% your responsibility to fix yourself from them because nobody else is going to do it. No, that's for sure. Nobody, nobody, you know, that's just, you know, no one, everybody's too busy doing their own thing. What, uh, yeah, for, for myself, um, you know, was, was, uh, just anger, you know, just anger inside. And, and it wasn't, and it, it, it was nothing that I would like go out of my way to be angry, but I would just get triggered really quickly. And it, and it, you know, it was, it was coming out in all different kinds of areas. Um, you know, even at work or here or there cost me, you know, cost me a, a good job. And, you know, and that was, that was after I stopped, you know, doing, no, I was still doing, you know, actually I was still on opiates. Like I've been, I've been off of opiates probably for over a year. So my, my, my situation is a little bit different. How I do my, uh, my, it, what, it, it, that's, it's not really sobriety. It's just how I do my thing. Um, so I've, I've been off of meth because that was my drug of choice for a long time. Um, but at some point I, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't really, I don't really like the program, like the, the rooms that the AA and NA, they just, to me, they weren't, uh, 
in the area that I was in, they weren't really inviting. They were kind of clicky. Uh, it just, I just, it just didn't feel like a place that I wanted to open up at. And so I went a little different route. I mean, I, I, st- I, I think what, so I don't know. I, I finally, it must have been, I know when it, it was, uh, I was hanging out with a bunch of friends and up until that point, I was like really, really strict. Uh, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And I just decided, I'm like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, to see if I can handle this again, you know, cause it, you know, alcohol was never my drug of choice. Uh, pot was never my drug of choice. You know, it was usually all the other things. And so what I, what I did. And so I just, I would have a beer and I'd be cool. And then that would go on for a while. And then finally it was, you know, I, I don't really like drinking. I don't like being out of control like that. I don't like how, how being drunk makes me feel. It gives me a headache too. So now, I mean, if I'm, if I'm in a social situation, I'll have a beer or two and then that's it. I'm done. And for me to get off of opiates, I used, uh, edibles to kind of, um, get me, uh, to, to, I mean, I weaned myself down and then I used, uh, edibles to make the transition. So you don't, you don't feel sick. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. And that's worked for me. And, you know, now like whenever my, I have some pain or whatever, I'll just, I'll just, you know, take a little edible and, and it'll go away. And that's just kind of how I roll. Um, everybody does it differently. I, I don't suggest that to people, you know, especially if it's not, you know, your drug of choice or, you know, or, you know what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah. God bless you with the edibles, man. I can't do it. If I eat an edible, I'll be folding the dishes. I can't do it. But, no, I actually I actually started getting put on meds when I was locked up. And I've been on medication for the entire time with the exception of when I was pregnant with my daughter because the medicines aren't safe to take for the baby. So I stopped taking everything then. Um. And I actually took myself off medication and I've been off of it for, shoot, I want to say about six months now, maybe. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made, first and foremost. I just, I started to notice that I wasn't, I, the medicines were starting to make me feel like a robot because I was starting to learn how to accept my emotions and work with them. So I didn't want them. So them being suppressed was actually doing me more harm than good because all all I did was feel even all the time. Now, I'm not saying that the medication that I was on for a long time didn't help me at a time in my life because it absolutely did. But it just was becoming a more harmful coping mechanism than it was a helpful one. So I took myself off of that and I smoke weed a few times a day and it's, this is the healthiest and happiest and most at peace I have ever been. So everybody has their own thing. I do not, you know, some people are on methadone and that keeps them off of, you know, heroin. God bless you. If that's what's keeping you clean and making you feel good about yourself, God bless you. I don't knock anybody. You do what you do to make yourself happy, but just make sure you're being true to yourself and you're doing it because it'll come back to bite you in the ass. Um... As far as uh, anger and whatnot that you were talking about, um, in my experience, anger has been a blanket emotion. Um, by that, I, I mean like a literal figurative like blanket. It just kind of coats itself on top of everything else and is has or had become what I was comfortable with feeling. Anger was my go-to for everything. I didn't want to feel anything else. I refused to let me, so I became comfortable with it. And even though I hated it, it's just all I ever knew. You know, and it took me a very, very long time, and I had to mess up quite a few times before I realized that a lot of what my anger actually was was grief or fear. And it was in coming to that realization 
that was another one of the most freeing points in my life that I was able to face a lot of what my fears were. And, I mean, I still have my days. I mean, we, none of our days are going to be perfect. It doesn't matter how long we're on this earth. I mean, we're going to have days where we just, it, they're just absolute shit. But I have learned to work with the emotions and I have learned to not just settle with anger. I will initially, you know, feel the anger, but I'll check myself, you know, after a couple of minutes and I'm like, okay, wait a minute, you know, what the hell's your problem? You know, you're not really angry. What's really going on? And like, I literally have to talk to myself sometimes. But when I pay attention to myself and try to figure this shit out, I always am able to do so. So I don't know if that helps you at all or if that makes sense to you at all, but the minute you said that anger was pretty much something that you felt that resonated with me 100% because I was the same way for a very, very long time. Very long time. Yeah. Very angry person. I would rearrange your face just for looking at me funny back in the day, man. Yeah, I, 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 I've, do I've dove into it. Um, and, and for myself, it was, uh, you know, the underlying stuff, a lot of times just insecurity or, Oh, or it's what I had witnessed, you know what I mean? Just repeating what I had seen grow growing up. Um, you know, I was a latchkey kid. I didn't have any discipline. So, I mean, I basically could do anything that I wanted, you know, growing up from the time I was in third grade all the way till I got out of school or, or got or left the house. Um, you know, cause there was no one there to supervise me. So I took those, those bad habits, um, into adulthood and continued it, you know, for the, until I was 33 and, you know, I was doing drugs, selling drugs, doing this, doing, I mean, I, I've lived a pretty badass life and not badass in a good way, like a badass in a, in a bad way. Um, you know, just from just the things that I would, I, I did, you know, I, it was, I was very manipulative. Um, and I was also a leader too. So, you know, and when I mean by a leader, like I'm just, I always, uh, just even in jobs and everything now, I, I always gravitate towards leadership roles, you know, whether it's a superintendent or a foreman. And so I was that way as well, even in the drug world. So, I mean, I always, I always wanted to be the one that was on top and, you know, I would have, have guys, you know, doing, doing crimes for me because I could afford, I, I was paying them in drugs. And so they would go and take the risk and, you know, I'd provide everything. And, uh, it was just, you know, I, I just found a way to manipulate people to get them to do what I wanted them to do or needed them to do. You know, I didn't really care about them at all. You know, they were just a means to an end, just like women. You know, I, I did the same thing there, you know, whatever it, it's the, the way that I can describe it is, is it was almost like going through life and just sort of, yeah, I want this. I want this. I don't want this anymore. Get out of here and you know, with people, but with people. And, you know, I just, I just, ah, just when I think back about it now, I'm just like, man, you're just, you're just a fucking, ah, it, it's just, <laughs> yeah, man. It's just, well, I mean, I, and when I think of a douchebag, I think of like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, like an indie, uh, like what do they call those guys? Those, uh, the hipster, like a hipster, you know, with, with Hipsters. long, yeah, like a hit that, that's what I think of as douchey. Um, but like for me, a douchebag is not even the word. Just fucking, just I don't know, man. You know? I was a scumbag. I mean, there's no other way to say it. I was a scumbag. I was a, I was a coward. I was a bitch. I, I just, I was a miserable, horrible, damn near evil, selfish woman for a very, 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 very long time. A very long time. Yeah. But, like when someone said, it's you know, not who I am anymore, and I will never go back to being that person again. I'll die first. Mm -mm. Yeah, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't think of of the things that I've been through per se. Like that's who I was. That's just that's just shit that I've been through. You know, the, the you know going to prison, you know being in seventeen different institutions between between prisons and drug rehabs and you know whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, that's, it, that's not who I am It you know, sometimes as, as you know, we get in these, these, uh, patterns and we can't get out of them. 
and it we're it's almost like we're on a, a a repeat cycle you know or on a continuous loop and you know you it's like i don't even know what it was that that caused me to turn turn the uh turn the corner it was just all of a sudden for the first time you know that was the meth but you know even the last time that i uh you know with the uh, opiates and everything else it uh it was just it was a mindset thing and it was the weirdest thing because it was like all these times i always felt like you, you know when you're about to run out and you would get really sick i think a lot of that is just your mind was was making you sick i mean i know there's a little bit of a physical dependence to it but it was crazy when i decided like that's it i'm done I didn't feel any of that sickness anymore. You know what I mean? To the point that when I would, I, it, even when I, I stopped, I would still get my prescription and you know what you do with that. But, uh, I, I would take them every now and then, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't need them. I would take them and then I would stop. And, and then finally I just, I just stopped period. Well, what stopped me is that the, the, so my, my doctor, um, I switched out. Well, my other doctor went to another, uh, another facility. So I had to get somebody else. And this doctor came in and this was when I realized that they're starting to really, really crack down on the shit. Cause the other doctor would drug test me, right. To make sure it was in my system. And I had pot in my system too. And he would never say anything about it. And this guy, he was like, he, he tested me for everything and was trying to get a picture of like who I was. And he was like, Hey man, if you, if you want to keep getting your prescription, you need to come back with, uh, with, you know, just not have marijuana in your system. And I was like, you know what? I'm not giving that up. You can keep the pills. I don't give a fuck about them. I'm not giving it up. (laughs) Nope. That's the only thing that keeps me sane. I told my doctors beforehand that I was planning on taking myself off of all the medications and they were vehemently against it, but it's just, it's something I just, and I still can't describe or understand the, where the desire came from. It was literally just this random thought that popped into my head going, you know, what? why are you taking this shit still? You know what I mean? And... I went through kind of like a weird withdrawal symptom just from taking those, but it was bizarre. I mean, it it wasn't like withdrawing from pain pills or anything like that. It was just like a mental one. Like, I felt like my brain went from watching TV like in regular TV and like now I see it in HD. You know what I mean? And I don't sit and get high all day long, but I smoke weed a few times a day and it helps me focus. It helps me with my anxiety and whatnot. I'm a better mother. I'm a better wife. I'm a better person. There's nothing, nobody in this universe can convince me that smoking a little bit of weed is bad for me or makes me a bad person. I know what a bad person is. I was a very bad person for a very long time. Me smoking weed to keep me sane and get me through my busy day does not make me a bad person. Yeah. A lot of the things that I do now, like, are like, minor minute and it's like god if this is the worst of things that i'm doing man i'm doing all right oh yeah for sure i mean i get people that know i smoke oh, you're a mom and you smoke weed I'm like yeah i go while well, you swallow your volume down with a bottle of wine susan you know people people want to judge that's all they want to do and when you let the opinions of others influence your mood, I mean, you're kind of handing them power to control the type of day you have. So I just don't really, honestly, I, I, I know people out there don't like me, and that's okay. I mean, I'm I'm not made for everybody, <laughs> you know, but there's going to be people that like me, and there's going to be people going to be people that love me and there's going to be people that don't like me and there's going to be people that hate me and everybody's going to have their opinions and that's okay. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. I just, I choose to no longer give people the power to dictate what type of mood. Like, you're, I know who I am. 
I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm not doing, and that's that's okay with me. That's all I need. For the very first time in my life, who I am and how confident I am and where I stand is not based on the opinions of others or what I think I should be because this is what they think I should be. No. I am comfortable in my own skin with who I am. With me and myself, first and foremost, but as, you know, like I said, as a as a mom, as a wife, as everybody, and I'm not going to let anybody take that away from me. I just won't. You know, the only person I that I give a fuck what they think is my daughter. That's it. Anybody else, I could care less. You know, you don't you don't pay my bills. You don't, you're not in my skin. You don't go through the things that I go through. You don't, you know, and I don't go through anything that you guys go through. So, I mean, and, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want you renting space in my head and I don't want to rent space in your head. Um, you know, and that's just kind of how I, I go about things now. I mean, I used to care about what people thought, you know, to the point where it was like, why, you know, now it's just, you know, if you like me, you like me. If you don't, you don't. This is who I am. This is what I have to offer. I'm a really cool guy if you get to know me, but I could be a real fucking asshole too. So, you know, don't, 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 don't be a dick and you won't get a dick in return. You know, I just, I want to, I want people to treat me the way that, that I'm going to treat them. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to be straight up with you. And, you know, a lot of people can't handle that, man. A lot of people don't want to know the truth. I mean, it's definitely is easier to sit back in, you know, the nice protective bubble that you put around yourself and you know, just sit and point your fingers and believe, you know, what the TV tells you to believe and, you know, the politicians and all other bullshit. It, but it's a lot harder to turn around and face what reality actually is. And the reality is up until a certain point, humans are very selfish, self-centered people. Now, we all have the ability to not be selfish, self-centered people, but it's easier. And <clears throat> with as desensitized as everybody has become to pretty much anything and everyone nowadays, I mean, it's downright scary to watch just how hate seems to be winning in so many different ways. And there's many different levels to, of hate. You know, it's not as simple as just the word. I mean, there's many, it's it's a honeycomb effect, you know. Hate trickles down into everything, but it's also the beginning of everything, too you know, racism, bigotry, you know what I mean? All the violence, oh my God, the violence just, it's, we are literally burning our world piece by piece by piece every day, and it's terrifying to me, truly terrifying, especially, I don't know if, I know you're from California, but I don't know what part, but I'm about 20 minutes east from, or uh, west from Chicago, and I spend a lot of my time and some of the bad parts of Chicago doing what I do for Come Find Me. And being out there has been, this past year, has been one of the most amazing and humbling experiences of my life. I mean, these people from Englewood and Austin and uh, West Pullman, and Pullman, you know, these, and from one of some of the worst parts of Chicago are some of the big-hearted, most amazing people I have ever met in my entire life. And it doesn't surprise me. For just as much violence as there is in Chicago, there is that much love and compassion, too. It's just people are scared to show it because showing love and showing compassion is deemed a sign of weakness in today's society. And, you know, these kids are born into families where they see nothing but blood and guns and drugs from, I mean, the time that they're babies, they, they know nothing else, you know, and everybody says, you know, you just change, just change. Do you have any, well, I know you do, and I know I do, but it is unbelievably hard to pull yourself out of something that you're familiar with, no matter how detrimental it is to your health or your survival or your happiness. 
If it is familiar, it is not easy to change. Okay? Now, people look at gangs and, you know what I mean? This, this is why I have come to believe that, you know, when I say demons, I don't mean, you know, these little red figures running around with pitchfork and, you know, horns and stuff like that. I feel that evil comes to us in forms of things that we love, you know, promising you know, happiness and all that stuff. In my case, my personal demon is opioids. Uh, pain pills made me feel <laughs> like I was on top of the world for a very long time when it was doing nothing but burying me deeper and deeper and deeper, and that's how it gets you, you know. Gangs offer, you know, a family, solace, you know, people that care about you. Never mind that, you know, there's a good chance that you're going to be dead by the time you're 20. Never mind that there's a chance that you're going to have to, you know, take the life of somebody else. You know, because people want love. They want acceptance. They don't care where they get it from. People are so desperate to be cared about that they don't care where they get it from anymore. Because nobody's willing to offer it anymore. Everybody is scared to care about somebody because they're scared they're going to get hurt. And nobody is realizing that the more that they don't offer their open arms and heart to somebody, that they're destroying themselves too. Nobody wants to be alone. You know what I mean? There's not one person on the face of this earth that wants to be by themselves without anybody in the world caring about them. You know what I mean? Not truly. Not at their core. You know, we're not solitary beings by nature, any of us. And it kills me to watch, you know, these these kids committing suicide, you know, from bullying and just all these young kids. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I do for Come Find Me, uh, one of the things that I do is I put up something called a declaration um, I go to the spot where an individual lost their life, and I put up a piece of paper with their name, uh, their age, and their COD, or cause of death, with a written proclamation for me that I will not let their life be, or their life, um, their death, I'm sorry, their death be in vain. Um, and I tape it to the nearest light pole or steady source of, you know, whatever that I can, predominantly a light pole. Um, I mean, most of the, there's so many people out there that don't even make it to the age of 20, 21. You know, I just re-upped something that I, it's called the lost lives list, um, that I keep track of every documented homicide in the city. And as of right now, today, we're at 208 homicides already. These are only the documented ones. You know what I mean? It's it's utterly insane to just watch the death toll. I mean, from violence, from drugs. Um, a friend of mine just OD'd last night. He's sitting in the hospital right now. He's brain dead. He's, he's not looking good at all. So is... is uh, I mean, so when we... Because I'm in California. I mean, we're pretty... I mean, there's not a whole lot of bad things that go on in California. Um, but when you, you know, we, we listen to other podcasts you listen to our uh our you know the 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 puppet in the white house um you know they they make it seem like chicago's the the you know a, a really really bad place i mean is it really that bad i mean i don't know oh i mean it depends on where you go i mean if you go downtown into chicago no i mean chicago is beautiful it's absolutely gorgeous. It's stunning. I mean, all the buildings and everything, but there's a lot of areas in Chicago that are very dangerous to go to. I mean, that is, when I go out at nighttime, if I have anybody with me, I slap a bulletproof vest on them. You know, I mean, there was uh, this Memorial Day weekend, over just over a weekend, there was like 30 people shot. No, I mean, you definitely don't want to be going into certain neighborhoods by yourself, especially if you don't know the neighborhood. But, I mean, are there some absolutely stunning parts of Chicago? Yes. I would go as far to say that most of Chicago is absolutely beautiful. The lake is beautiful. The beaches. Just all the different things to do. The restaurants and the shows. You know what I mean? It's. 
I'm proud to say I'm from Chicago. But, you know, I care about... I care about the people in the neighborhoods that people don't care about anymore. And it is... I have made it my my mission to do everything that I can with every talent that I have to be able to make a difference. And I won't stop until I do. Well, somebody needs to, because, you know, the, the, the state, the government, they're, they're not fixing anything. They're, they're more part of the problem than they are the solution. And it it was by design too. I mean, that that's all coming out now as well. You know, how they, how they, you know, engineered certain areas to you know where it's just constantly going to be depressed you know it was the same way that it was you know 50 years ago 60 years ago in certain areas nothing's changed it's still depressed nobody cares nobody you know what i mean they're not investing shit into these communities and you know they're they're i don't know man I, the the thing that really bothers me the most about all of this is that um you know our our government has a huge part in in why things are the way they are you know why why the family unit's been broken up in the way that it has with the war on drugs and how they were the ones you know not really but i mean they were but it wasn't directly responsible for flooding the streets with cocaine and crack No, I mean, there's just shit. I mean, if you want to have a conversation about this, we'll have to do a whole other podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's some very deep, you know, deep-rooted issues. I mean, the originations of all these certain problems, yeah, it's it's insane. I mean, the, and the more that I learn and the more that I dig and the more that I see, it, it sickens me what humanity is capable of, but... That is a whole other conversation for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. That could be a very interesting podcast session for you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into that one right now. And and as we have it, guess what? We're 57 minutes in. Flies, huh? Oh wow! Yeah, my husband is gonna kill me. He's probably wanted to come to bed for like the last half hour. I didn't realize how much time had gone by. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you start getting into good conversation and it just goes right by. So is there anything... Oh, yeah. I love talking about this stuff. I could literally sit and talk about all these different types of things for hours and hours and hours. So, Yeah, we may have to get back to that uh, other one, uh, that other topic at some point um, down the road. Uh, you know, like I, I don't, I'm not an expert on anything. I don't do a whole lot of research on a lot of stuff. I mean, I like to think that I listen to people or podcasts that are, um, that have good information and valid information. But I mean, I, I don't do a lot of the research myself and go and, and, and check facts and, and all this other stuff. I just regurgitate shit that I hear from other people. And a lot of people do the same thing. But I mean, there are truths, there, there are truths out there that are very disturbing and I, uh, it just makes it very difficult to, even want to participate in all that bullshit that goes on in Washington and, and, you know, the government and everything else. It's like, eh. I mean, at some point, when are we going to realize and stop being duped? You know, these, these people don't give a shit about you. They don't fucking care. You know, all they care about is lining their pockets and, and, you know, being reelected in another term. I can't stand politicians, politics, any of it. It all makes me sick. There's no such thing as an honest politician. There's no such thing. Absolutely not. I don't even bother following pretty much anything. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah, I've disconnected from everything. I don't, uh, you know, like you were talking about, you know, you were off pharmaceuticals. I don't take anything anymore. Anything that, that's a pill other than maybe a multivitamin, but any, any pharmaceutical, nope, no more. It, it's got to be natural. Um, I don't listen to mainstream uh, media anymore. You know, cause I, I really truly believe that you need to put everything healthy in you, like from food to what you listen to. Because, you know, when you, I, so for like, when I start listening to some conspiracy podcasts, like some of these, like ones that go down really deep rabbit holes and I spend too much time listening to them my mindset starts to change into that and people start to to see that, you know? So I, I'm really careful about what I, 
what I let into my head these days. No, I'm the same way, dude. I understand 100% of what you're saying. I tend to absorb what I'm seeing or what's around me or what I'm hearing. You know, even just being around people who are just constantly negative, you know what I mean? It, it drains me. You know, and even lately, I haven't been feeling very good because, like, my diet's been kind of off, just been kind of go, go, go lately, and I feel it. You know, I need to regulate my shit and get back on track. So, no, everything that you take in is what you're going to put back out and vice versa. You know, everything. And it's just about kind of balancing everything. Something else that I've learned that's been pretty pretty helpful in making me make some pretty significant, significant positive changes health-wise and whatnot, too. Well, that's awesome, man. And, uh, I'm really, I'm really happy for you. I'm, I'm, you know, things are going good for you, it seems. And, uh, that, that's great, man. You know, it's always, it's always good to, to hear a story, you know, somebody that's turned their life around and they're on a, on a brand new trajectory and, you know, things are, are looking up. So is there anything that you want to plug social media or anything like that, your page? Is there any what, Sean? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that. Is there any social media that you want to plug, like your your come come with me page or uh, anything else? The come find me page. Yeah, the come find me. Sorry. Did, did you say talk about it? I'm sorry. Now all of a sudden your phone is breaking up. <laughs> okay. Did you want to plug anything like uh, you know uh, any social media where anybody can find you, or are you just good? You know, we're just. Plug the the come find me on Facebook, and that is a. Uh... Oh, see, I'm such a loser. I don't I didn't know what plug means. Um, well, my name is Angelise Tomasino, and I run an anti senseless violence organization called Come Find Me. Uh, I am also an advocate for addicts. Um, you can find me at. Uh, you can search at a safer Chicago to go directly to the Come Find Me page, or you can search my name, Angelise Tomasino, and add me as a friend from there. I am always willing to listen to somebody if they need someone to talk to. I don't turn my back on anybody, so please just understand that you are not alone. All right, great. Well, you you keep keeping it down there in Chicago, and uh, and and you know, keep making a change out there. Likewise, man. Thanks for having me on. I really, this was, this was fun. I like this. Yeah. And thanks for, for making the time because uh, what is it over there right now? It's 10, almost 11 o'clock. Oh, I am about two hours past my bedtime. That's the time it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate you making the time and, and, and the adjustment so we can do this. And, uh, I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted as to when it's going to come out and, and all that other stuff. And then I'll, uh, and it, uh, send me a Facebook uh, message with your, with your, uh, your email address. And then I'll, I'll, I'll drop you a line of, of, and have you uh, put, put that uh, social media stuff on there so I could add it to the, the notes in the podcast. So whoever listens to this podcast can go down there and they can find you as well. Absolutely. Thank you again so much for having me on Sean. I really, really appreciate it. All right, man. You have a good day, uh, good evening, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Likewise. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the show, and thank you to Angelise. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I enjoyed your perspective and the way and your outlook on on life and and you know your past and how you've been dealing with things. And I'm sorry I got your name wrong uh, twice, I think. And I also got your come with me wrong. I think it was going to come find me. But anyways, apologize for that. We will get it right in the notes section, I promise. Um, and then also, here we are at the uh, part of the podcast that is is the most trivial to me. If you got anything out of this podcast, please subscribe rate and review in iTunes or wherever platform that gives you the option to do that. It helps us. Uh, it gives us feedback. I mean, I'm talking about us as in podcasters and us as, as the show. Um, it gives us feedback and, and kind of lets us know where, where we are. And if, you know, what we're doing is reaching people and, 
you know, if it's helping people, uh, it's sort of like a, uh, like a, a, a temperature gauge, I, I, so to say. Anyways, um, I, I feel silly all the time. Every time I ask that and every time I go, I feel like I'm begging for your, uh, your input and your feedback. And this isn't really unique to my podcast. It's, I mean, this is something that I, I've, I'm hearing on the boards all the time. Everybody is always, Hey man, how do you, how do you get, you know, people to rate your stuff? And, and you just, they just say, well, keep, keep pushing them, keep pushing them, keep pushing them, keep pushing them. So, well, I guess I'm just going to keep doing it. And hopefully at some point, you know, those will increase. And once again, uh, check out the uncontained podcast with Aaron, the static render episode 171. That is an interview with me with good content. So go ahead and check it out and, uh, rate that one and review it too. If you can, uh, until next time, keep it 100, stay true to yourself. Everything else is just noise. <laughs>